Hi, my name is Lauren Centrella and I'm the Interim Chief Development Officer here at WAMU. As a public media organization, our mission is to connect listeners and members like you to each other and the world. We offer our audience opportunities to learn and engage both with the news as well as in cultural conversations like this. Public, ra public radio works because listeners and members who value the service step up and give back. Support from listeners and members is also our most reliable and important source of funding, especially right now. This book club would not be possible if we didn't have your support. Whether this is your first book club event or your 10th, if you enjoy the discussion today, please consider making a gift to support this series of events. You can donate at dianereem.org slash give. We are grateful for the over 1,000 people who registered to join us today. I also want to recognize and apologize that our planned conversation with Elizabeth Strout that was scheduled to take place immediately following this panel was canceled. In the two and a half years of the Diane Reem Book Club, this was the first cancellation we've had, which seems fairly remarkable in these times. We're glad to have you with us for this discussion. This event is being recorded and closed captioning is available. Just click the CC button on your screen. And now let's start the discussion with the host of our book club, Diane Reem. Hi there, everybody. And as always, I'm so glad to have you with us. Today's book club will discuss Lucy by the Sea by Pulitzer printing, Pulitzer Prize winning author Elizabeth Stroud. It's set during the first year of the COVID pandemic. And the novel follows Lucy Barton as she flees New York City for Maine with her ex-husband, William. As months of isolation and anxiety go by, Lucy has to adjust to an altered life and indeed an altered world. Joining me today, Dolan Perkins Valdez. She's professor of literature at American University and the author of three novels, including Take My Hand. Brock Clark is professor of English at Bowdoin College. His latest books are the novel, Who Are You? Calvin Bledsoe, and the essay collection, I Grape. And finally, Lily Meyer, a writer and book critic whose work appears frequently in The Atlantic. We'll be taking your questions throughout our discussion. You can type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Welcome to all of you. Thanks for having me. So pleased to have you with us. I'm interested in how you saw, see Lucy as a character. Um, she is something of a character in that she talks to me. I don't know about you all, but she talks to me as though she's sitting in the room with me with her thoughts, her answers at the ready. How does that work for you, Lily? Oh, it works absolutely the same way. I love Elizabeth Strout's work, and I especially love her prior Lucy novels, My Name is Lucy Barton and O. Oh William. And I will say, I thought it was brilliant of Strout to write a COVID novel centering on a character who so many of us know already and love already. Where we who have read, especially My Name is Lucy Barton, are so ready to care about how Lucy experiences the pandemic. 
You know, um, Dolan, I gather this is the first of Elizabeth Strout's novels that you've read. Tell me what you thought of Lucy by the Sea. Well, I did read Olive Kittredge, which I loved years ago when it came out, but I've never read a Lucy Barton novel. So this was definitely my first introduction to Lucy. And I really felt I didn't have to have those other books. I felt like she planted me right in this moment in Lucy's life. And I was right there with her. Um, The first chapter, of course, you know, she sort of caught us up on what's been going on with her. But after that, everything slowed down and we're right there in the in those early months of the pandemic. And I felt like I all she was like an old friend. That's great. An old friend, Brock. Uh sure. I mean it's interesting. So I've I've read I think almost everything that that uh Liz has written. And uh there's always this conversational quality to her work. I think that's even more true in the Barton books than it is in, in the Kittredge books. Um, and part of what's interesting to me about the voice and the conversation is that you never know entirely which way it's going to go. It's like being with someone uh, who's, uh, you feel like you you can trust them and then they take this sharp turn. And sometimes the turn is heartwarming and sometimes it's defensive. And this is what makes her an interesting writer to me. Interesting is a mild word, I think brilliant writer because you never know entirely where she's going to go in the novels. Give me an example that you felt where she takes a sharp turn. Bro. Yeah, this, so, so in, in as much of this novel, this novel is remarkable for its sweetness, I think. Uh, but then there are these moments where she's recalling a time where she went to talk to a classroom uh, in Illinois. It was her, it was her uh, the college she went to. And she really loathes the students. She just hates them. And uh, she hates them because they hate her or she thinks they do. And then one of them, she imagines saying to them something like, when con- uh, when climate change comes, uh, you will be not a person or something like that. And, and then she says, and I actually thought that. I can't believe I thought that, but I did. And that's a, a great moment for me because you realize how sensitive she can be. And when she's sensitive, she's sort of, expresses a kind of anger that seems at odds with her the rest of the time. And there was another appearance that she was to make at a college, and it turned out that not one person showed up. Mm -hmm. Now, was it your impression, Lily, that as she assumed, that the professor who had arranged her appearance hadn't bothered to publicize the event, or was it something else? You know, I used to teach undergraduates in my PhD (laughs) program. I know (laughs) you both teach undergrads. I know how disinclined to show up they can be. But like Brock, I think of Lucy as someone who's very easily hurt and somebody who rushes to protect herself. One of her amazing and odd self-protective strategies in this novel is she speaks constantly to an imaginary mother who she's made up. Her own mother was very harsh, very not demonstrative of love, let's say. And except except when Lucy was in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And and those moments struck me as so tender. Um, and perhaps it's from those moments that Lucy makes up this nice mother. That's exactly my theory about it too, that the hospital visits in My Name is Lucy Barton generated the nice mother. But, you know, I see Lucy thinking that the professor must not have publicized her visit as coming from the same place in, you know, the same hurt little place in Lucy that needs the nice mother that says, oh, I need to be protected from my hurt. Um, I also thought it was rather remarkable that at the very beginning of the book, here is Lucy living her life in her comfortable apartment in New York City. 
her ex-husband, with whom she's been friendly, even though he cheated on her during their marriage. He calls her and says, Lucy, I'm taking you to Maine. And Lucy doesn't understand anything about why she is being taken to Maine. And yet, Dolan, she goes with him. <laughs> what was your reaction? Well, you know, did none of us knew. I mean, and William in the book is so remarkably prescient about what is about to happen. But I remember when in January of 2020, a public health studies professor told me that I shouldn't take a trip to Seattle because that was ground zero for COVID. And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I went on that trip, you know, and I was there and then I went to, I was all over the place. So none of us knew. And that's one of the reasons why I felt so close to Lucy from the very beginning, because we were all still doing things. I had actually tickets to a Broadway show um, the, the week that Broadway shut down, you know, and she references that in the book. And I was going to go until, you know, my friend said she walked by the ticket booth and saw that Broadway had shut down. And I said, what? <laughs> uh, we were going to see Harry Potter, my daughter and I. So um, none of us really knew, but I feel like with Lucy, you know, it pushes a little bit at her denial because it's a real, it is a real disruption mm -hmm. to her comfort. Um, but I, but I also feel like it was a disruption to all of our comfort. Well, of course. Someone said to me that she felt that the start of the book, Brock, um, was more a review of what we all had experienced and that later on in the book, it became more interesting because of her involvement with her children, her involvement with her ex-husband, her involvement with Bob Burgess, that it all became more interesting then. How did you feel about it? Yeah, by someone you mean Lily, I think. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. So, it's, you know, the Liz has taken on something really difficult in this book, she, which she always does. COVID is one of those things we're just not supposed to write about. Um, and the theory is because people want to be done with it and they don't want to be reading about it, uh, which I get. And there's a certain kind of danger there. And there's a danger in doing a kind of newsreelish approach to what we already think we know. Um, I actually liked the beginning in part because you can sense this is great line early on where Lucy says something like she didn't know where to put her mind. And I thought she did a really good job, she meaning Strout, really good job of showing how scattershot uh, people were, not just in terms of their behavior, but in terms of the way they talked and they thought. And I thought that was sort of well done and chilling and then led then to the latter half of the novel, which I really and truly loved. Um, I mean, I loved all of it, but especially when all of these people kept coming back. I mean, there's a kind of like greatest drought hits in this novel, like, hey, here comes Bob Burgess and here comes, you know, Olive Kittredge. And I, normally I would, I would be suspicious of that, but it's handled so lightly and so naturally that I was excited by it. One of our listeners wrote, it's a comment from Sue. She says, um, I love the glimpses of Olive Kittredge you gave us in Lucy by the Sea. They were like finding hidden Easter eggs. Uh, Olive is as ornery and upfront as ever. I was very glad to find her alive and <laughs> kicking. It's fun how she brings in those characters, Lily. How did they strike you? Oh, absolutely fun. One of the things that I love about Strout's work, and one of the things that makes me think of her as a real, you know, great American writer, is her evocation of life and community, and the way that she's gradually turned her body of work into a community. 
you know, it's something that Marilyn Robinson has also done with her Gilead novels, also yes. in and around Gilead, Iowa. I think of the two of them together as just real American greats. And I was very conscious of that community while I was reading Lucy by the Sea. When um, you read that uh, William wanted to take her to Maine, why do you think Maine don't, and why did he want to take her there? Well, um, you know, of course, I think he wants to see his sister and uh, uh. <laughs> uh, make that connection again, even though he's been rejected by her. Um, so he has that sort of secret um, uh, intention. But I also think Maine plays such an important role for Stroud. I used to teach in Maine and I was up there a lot. And even though it's a very large state, there is a sense of community among Mainers, right? There's a you know, there's a real sense of identity to be a Mainer. And um, there's, we see, for example, when um, Bob sees the woman who he remembers from his childhood, I think that was Bob and he remembers, was it Bob? And so we see these, and to me, like this really fits in this book, even when we talk about the appearance of Olive, right? Like, because so much of the pandemic was about connection and disconnection, especially during those early days of isolation. We really learned who we wanted to connect with and, you know, who we didn't care if we never saw again. I mean, right, like we all had a real sense of who was meaningful in our lives. And, and I think one of the things they gain when they go to Maine is just a sense of like meaning. They have a smaller friend group, but it's, it's much more meaningful maybe than it had been in the city. What about the revelations regarding Williams? mother's background. Uh, her name was Catherine, and she had been portrayed as someone who had come from wealth, from privilege, from an esteemed historical background, and yet there are so many revelations about her, Brock. Yeah, so this is, I guess, related to both Stroud's reason for bringing them to Maine and William's reason for bringing them to Maine. And those aren't necessarily the two same things. Uh, Stroud's makes perfect sense. It's not just as what Lily's also talking about with the idea of community and novel writing. It's like, hey, let's bring this novel up to a community that she's already made and see what happens. That to me is really interesting. Uh, what I really like about William's ulterior motives is that it fits in with larger doubts about his character. Uh, so you asked earlier, Diane, uh, were, were we surprised when she, uh, he said, let's go to Maine and she went. And my idea, because you know, of their fraught history, and my idea is that no one's ever gone for good in these Barton novels. Everyone's uh. coming back one way or the other. Uh, that's true of William himself. Um, that's true of his mother slash sister. Uh, it's true of Bob Burgess, who just appears in this novel um, with, with, with his baggy, crappy jeans. And uh, it just, there's a kind of, it's either fondness or it's distrust, but she's always finding another use for these characters. And Maine's a perfect vehicle for that. Maine, for me, uh, makes sense also in the sense that there were a lot of people coming. I live in Maine. I'm in Portland right now. And it's raining like crazy, if, if <laughs> anyone cares. Uh, uh, is that that was a really that was a real thing where a lot of people from New York were coming up to Maine and there was a kind of resentment building, yes. especially in more rural parts of Maine. Uh, and uh, I think the novel's true to that. Um, the, the the mystery involving his sister and mother, I thought was interesting. It's like one of the many balls in the air. And sometimes I forget about it and sometimes I pay attention to it. Um, but that's that's good. I think that's what the novel wants us to do. Really? I agree. I actually think the relationship between the resentment that some Mainers feel of Lucy and the revelations about William's mother's class background dovetail in an interesting way, because of course resentment of somebody who can come up to Maine to hide from the pandemic is a very valid form of class resentment. And I actually, you know, I was cr critical in my review of the book of the early COVID stuff. I did have that feeling you referenced earlier of 
the first part of this book is a tour of experiences that many of us had, but that's also a feeling that's about class, right? Like I have a job that let me sit at home and be safe, just like Lucy and William. Um, and I do think, you know, there's other stuff, COVID stuff I didn't love, but I do think she handles the COVID class stuff yeah. and the class dynamics in this part of Maine very gently and well. Yeah, it's kind of pipe in there. I think that's one of the things she does really well uh, across these novels is talking about class. And mm -hmm. she's also really self-conscious about why no one else is talking about class. And I think she's right to be self-conscious about that. It's a very difficult thing to do. And I think she does it pretty winningly in the way that, that Lily's talking about. No, one. I was really happy to see the section where um, Lucy describes how she has a habit of looking away because I felt that strongly throughout the novel that she is looking away. She's looking away from what's going on with the Black Lives Matters protests. She's looking away from what happens with the January 6th insurrection, although she acknowledges that it really seeps into her conscious and she has to really think it through. I, I really was happy that um, Strout placed that into the novel because I do think a lot of privileged people, you know, had had the sort of luxury of looking away in, in their small world. Um, Am I wrong or is this the first time that Stroud has made reference to absolutely current politics? I mean, I was surprised that she talked about, quote, our current president without mentioning him. Lily, what are you? You know, I remember reading the Burgess Boys around when it came out so quite some time ago um, and understanding that that book was drawing on tensions between um, Somali immigrants to Maine and people who thought of themselves as longtime Mainers. And that in some way I saw as a current events novel, but not in the way that Lucy by the Sea is. Um, Lucy by the Sea can almost feel like a time capsule. Um, and there is, I do think Strout walks a delicate line in trying to include a lot while remaining faithful to a character who is, like Dolan says, a person who looks away, a person who really can't help herself from looking away. Mm. And I did, you know, I've been on this hunt for kind of the first great COVID novel. So I've read just about every COVID novel that's come out so far and found myself comparing this to a lot of them. So comparing it say to Gary Steingart's Our Country Friend, which is a COVID comedy, don't love it. In that book, <laughs> everyone's looking away and no one mentions that they're looking away. And so in a bizarre way, it's a current events book that rejects current events. That's not what's happening here. Um, this is a, a much more thoughtfully handled current events book. Well, I, I kept thinking of love in the time of cholera and how complex that novel is. And yet in Strout's Lucy by the Sea, how straightforward it all is. But the uh, comparison kept coming into my mind. Here's a question from Deborah, who says, I was a little disappointed that Lucy seemed to let William make decisions for her, quote, going to Maine and possibly never coming back to New York even rekindling their intimacy. And Stroud made her into somewhat of a weaker character. Is that how you saw it, Dolan? Well, you know, I always say when you, as a writer, make a character who's imperfect, it's a fine line to walk because readers will judge that character very quickly. But I think that is, you know, I wrote notes in the back of my book that, you know, this is a character who is imperfect, who makes imperfect decisions, and who recognizes the imperfection of others, right? And so there is no perfect marriage. There is no perfect decision that we make, particularly when a person is making these decisions later in life when everyone has baggage. 
So I didn't judge her for that. If anything, I admired her for knowing what she knew, coming to the realization at the end of the book that, you know, she was dealing with someone who was imperfect and going back to him anyway, because that was a choice that she wanted to make. Brock, how did you feel about Williams taking charge in the way he did? Yeah, I feel it very similarly. Um, I I understand what the your caller in is talking about. I, I didn't feel that way though. It felt to me much. It was in line with the rest of the novel, where you have a character who's not, neither of them are perfect. Um, and I think that Lucy herself is aware that she's being passive in places um, and lets herself be passive, except for the moments where she doesn't want to be. Uh, and then she knows William ha William has ulterior motives, but also that she knows that he's not entirely untrustworthy either. So this seems to me true to life. Um, this is how relationships often work um, or don't work, right? Depending. I, I also love the moment, the idea that what I liked about their reunion was that it was about as opposite of gauzy as it could possibly be. Like the sex scene is basically a sex scene with no sex uh, and, <laughs> and things not working. And she's very upfront about that. And that seemed to me the absolute perfect way to handle this so-called reunion. Well, you know, earlier in the novel, Lucy is wondering why William keeps washing his blue jeans every two days. And he confesses to her that he's had prostate cancer and that his um, urinary flow is to a certain extent uncontrollable and thereby he needs to wash those blue jeans. I thought that was such a delicate moment between the two of them and Lucy accepted it, I thought, beautifully. How did you feel, Lily? Oh, I thought it was a gorgeous moment. I thought it was really subtle. I thought a lot about the various Philip Roth novels after Nathan Zuckerman has had prostate cancer and has lost the functions that are central to any Roth protagonist, let's say. <laughs> um, and the way that, you know, Roth handles that in his way and the way that Strout handles it for William is quite opposite. And I actually thought it was, I don't know, I found it very moving to read about what you could call what William himself might call a loss of masculinity from a female perspective and from the perspective of a woman who's cared about him in different ways for a very long time. I really, I thought it was a nice moment and actually quite an active moment of care on Lucy's part. She's not passive at all in those moments. But I must say, I myself got a little annoyed with William's how shall I put it, his very brief responses to Lucy's concerns. I mean, she said something like, um, I'm very worried, William. And he said, Lucy, you're always worried. And let it go with that. I mean, maybe she was creating that in William, but maybe she thinks men are that way. What do you think, Brock? Uh, <laughs> why are you asking me? Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, there's another moment like that in the grocery store where someone says, go back to New York to Lucy. And then she gets to the car and she says to William, I got yelled at. I hate to get yelled at. And he says something like, no one likes to get yelled at. And, exactly. and she resents that. But that, that seems to me a consistent part of his character. And there's a moment later on. So yeah, you, it's tempting to think of him as only callous. Um, but later on, she makes a really interesting reading of him. That is, Lucy makes an interesting reading of William, where she realized that he's someone who doesn't like to talk about the things that upset him. And then she sort of recalibrates her vision of his problem. It doesn't make it less of a problem, but she's got an interesting take on it. I thought it doesn't make the problem go away, but it means that both the writer and the narrator are aware of it, which to me 
changes everything. But yeah, yeah, he's often an unlikable character in yeah. the novel. And I, 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 yeah. that's true in previous novels too, so. The only time he is truly excited and happy in the book is after he has seen his half sister because of course his mother left her first husband who was a potato farmer and she ran off with a former Nazi soldier who had been brought to the US and is finally returned to Germany. And lo and behold, she goes with him and has William's half sister. I mean, that did that strike you as real, Dolan? You know, I felt like um, strange things happened for women. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, not just women, not just women. <laughs> oh, not just women. But I feel like there was such an expectation for women to, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about like women who leave their families, you know, mm -hmm. at, at that time. And uh, there was such an expectation for, you know, for women to stay with the family. I mean, it was not uncommon for a man to leave, but for a woman to leave, you had to be insane. And so um, I was really intrigued by that storyline. Um, I wondered if it had played out in another Lucy Barton book. I didn't know I hadn't read them, but I thought um, that's that's really, that, those decisions that she made were, were really intriguing. And, uh, and the sense of devastation that's left behind um, when a woman was, you know, just trying to make a decision that was the best decision maybe for her. For her. And then she has this other child in Germany and comes back, leaves the potato farmer, establishes that new life. What did you make of it, Lily? You know, I couldn't help thinking while I read it about the kids' book, Summer of My German Soldier, um, in which a teenage girl falls in love with a German POW, which, you know, I read as like a Jewish eight-year-old and thought, what is this? Um, but I loved it. It's a great book. Um, and I do think there's something in that storyline about a woman doing something that would have been seen as insane, a woman doing something that we might now see as morally icky, um, not leaving her husband, but, you know, leaving for a Nazi. It's just, I don't know, it's a form of complexity that I like to see invited into the novel. I'm sorry if you can all hear my dog drinking water very loudly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I do. Is it strictly realistic in the sense of would it happen, would it have happened in the lives of most people I know? Absolutely not. But could it have happened? Sure. Do I think it contributes to the book? Totally. Yeah, and what I like about it is that it, it's a big plot point in a novel that doesn't really have them. Uh, that's not really how the novel goes about its business. So then I'm grateful for it, like, hey, sure, uh, bring in a Nazi to the novel and have this sort of pot boiler. I really liked that that aspect of that thing. And, you know, the novel doesn't pay a ton of attention to it. It, it comes and goes. Right. But, but it, when it's there, I think it, it takes on a certain kind of weight. Except it it kind of plays a role in what Lucy comes to understand about her former mother-in-law, who clearly thought Lucy was beneath the class of her son um, and probably didn't make Lucy feel too good about herself during that marriage. That Go ahead, nice. Brock. Yeah, sure, that's true, right. I mean, I think it serves, this, this is also a part of Lucy's character where she's often insecure about the things uh, uh, she, could possibly, she should be more secure about. And so the world in some ways is conspiring to make her feel insecure. And that whenever she gets praised for the book she's writing, she seems surprised like, oh, 
you read these books, which clearly a lot of people have read in the novels, and each time she's surprised by them. So I think it all it all plays into this concept of one never feels good about oneself, uh, at least if one is loose. How yeah. much of Elizabeth Stroud do you think is in Lucy Barton? What do you think, Dolan? Ooh, I don't know that the answer to that question. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, Lily can answer that better than I can. You, you know more of her work. I'll say that, um, you know, Lucy feels like, you know, an aggregation to me of because she's so complicated. You know, she's got um, class insecurities. She is um, like, like we've already established, there's times when she really likes being passive make the decision and you know and a lot of um you know I think we talked earlier about her feeling easily wounded right a lot of her pain is sort of unimaginable like you know she what she witnessed the abuse with her brother and um you know uh the ways in which she had to make sense of a very complicated mother so she feels very much you know sort of like an aggregation of personalities to me you know in one complicated character and are we all Lily, yeah your thoughts well this is a bit of a prickly take that i have but my belief or my bias is that a character the protagonist of a novel that is auto fiction like a protagonist who's really based on the author never feels as alive or as vivid to me as a person who's made up i don't know what it is but i think a real loved, fleshed out, imperfect fictional character gets up off the page much more than a version of the author ever can. I don't know why, I just think that that's true. Not to say that I don't love plenty of auto fiction. I love Sheila Hetty, for example. But to me, Lucy is a character who's alive in a way that only a fictional character could be. You know, I've read a lot of Strout. I don't know a lot about her life. So, you know, maybe Brock's gonna tell me, oh no, Lucy and Liz are the same person. But that's hundred percent, hundred percent. No, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a mistake to to conflate the two. Um, I mean, maybe uh, readers do that because they feel that they they know the characters so well, they feel like they know the authors so well. But <laughs> I think there's a there's a big difference. Um, uh, there's always a big difference, as Lily said. Uh, the, the characters are alive when they are different. When there's the author's gone out of their way to make the character a character and not an expression of the author's autobiography or id or ego or anything like that. And, and I think as Dolan says, it's uh, the character is an aggregate of a bunch of different often competing impulses. So yeah, no, I don't, I think it's a mistake to, to confuse the two. Here's a question from Mary. What did you think about the way Stroud handled regret in the novel? It seemed that William had a lot of regrets about his philandering and his work. What do you think, Lily? I think regret and grief are two of the twin themes of the book. There's a, you know, there's a moment when Lucy, who loses her husband not long before the novel starts, you know, she talks about herself and William being locked in the silence of separate griefs. And I think that William, you know, he's grieving the losses he had with prostate cancer, but I think he's also having a lot of regret that contributes to that, you know, the short answer problem, the grumpiness problem we were talking about before. And I don't know, I am only in my 30s myself, so what do I know? But I would say that the person who gets to their 60s or 70s and doesn't experience regret would be from space. I mean, if William didn't have any regrets <laughs> about his life, and if Lucy weren't grieving anything about her life, I wouldn't trust them as characters. I think as far as regret goes, and we haven't talked much about Lucy's two daughters, mm -hmm. Becca and Chrissy, and Chrissy's miscarriages, Becca's own husband's infidelity, and yet um, it seems that Lucy has grown as a mother, and I myself really 
identified with that, the questions that you as a mother ask when a child is young and you as a mother or a father ask when a child is older. And Lucy is very cautious about her relationships with her daughter. Did you feel that, Dawn? Oh, yes. You know, well, Lucy, at the beginning of the book, remember, she's sort of a curmudgeon. She's like, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. You know, about everything. And by the end, she's expressing such love for her daughters. I was actually crying because I have two daughters. And she says at one point, you know, I knew when I was pregnant with Chrissy that this baby was not mine, that I was just here. I think she said something to like shepherd her into the world. And that's something that every mother has to sort of understand at some point. But it's very, very sad moment when you realize that, you know, and um, and so I was really moved by those last scenes with her and Chrissy and Becca and the intimacy between the three of them and how in so many ways the pandemic had allowed for this softening, like I said, clarifying for us all, you know, who was most important and what was most important. So I I, I actually was crying <laughs> in those last scenes. Brock? Uh, yeah, it was interesting. I thought she's really expert at describing how parents have to be interpreters of their children's moods. Um, and part of what complicates that is all the scrim between the two people, it could be masks in this case, or it could be technology, it could be distance, it could be not wanting to either hear unpleasant things or say unpleasant things. And despite that, or because of that, there becomes a kind of closeness at the end. And the, the reason I was so moved by it was because it was so hard earned and, and also compromised at the end. They, they also sell, say, say to Lucy, I don't think you should trust dad. And what should be a triumphant moment, that, I love that so much um, because it took and made that triumphant the triumph at the end, not quite as triumphant, which made it to me much more plausible than it would have been otherwise. But. You know, if that was so interesting because in the beginning, both her daughters said to her about going to Maine with William, you should, you should trust dad. He understands he is a scientist and he understands what's happening. So go, go with him. And then, as you say, Brock, at the end, when they seem to be renewing their long divorced and separated relationship, Lucy and William get back together. Now, it could be in the next novel, they're far (laughs) apart again. But I thought that was remarkable, Lily. Oh, yeah. Remarkable and complex. You know, there's this great moment that um, I'll read a bit of towards the end, not quite as far into the book as we've just been talking about, when William and Chrissy and Becca, the daughters, basically connive for Chrissy and Becca to surprise Lucy. They drive up to visit. um, You know, they air hug with masks on. And Lucy says to herself or to the reader, I have never seen anything as beautiful as those girls, these women, my daughters, exclamation point after my daughters. Drought's great with the the exclamation points. I just really, I think in that one little moment, you see how much William cares about the family separate from his romance with Lucy. He cares about their fractured but functioning family unit. And you also really see the lesson that Lucy has learned over the course of the pandemic. You know, the thing that Dolan was talking about, you can see her realizing these are not girls, these are women, but they're still my daughters. I still, they're still mine, even though they're these real adults really separate from me. You know, at the beginning, before the pandemic, Lucy lives in the same city as her daughters because of the pandemic, she becomes separated from them. I lived 10 minutes from my parents until the pandemic, right before it, I moved about a 10 hour drive away. So I went through this exact same thing with my own mother, with both of my parents during the pandemic. It was horrible, awful to be so far away and not be able to visit. And I really felt that in this novel. 
but it does, it changed our relationship in ultimately a way, you know, that was nice. It made us think about valuing each other as adults more, I think. And oh, you, what, yeah, a you see that, Lucy. what a wonderful experience for you to have and bring to this book. I must say, Lucy seemed awfully close to these young women having lunch with them was it every week or every other week at bloomingdale's and then you know walking around shopping i'm not sure that's something a dad would do brock but these two girls adored being with their mother i go shopping with my sons all the time do <laughs> any kind of shopping. I'm glad. Yeah, no, I don't. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's it's an interesting, what's interesting to me, I think that Lily's right about this, uh, and it's another sort of really moving part of the novel, but what's interesting to me uh, is that this goes back to the first Lucy novel, there's always distance between she and her daughters that she's trying to overcome, and the in the first Barton novel, it's the hospital room, where she's stuck in this hospital room, she can't go see them, and this becomes something both painful and something that has to be overcome. And so when it is overcome, I think I said this already, but it's really, uh, it means something because it's been so difficult. Um, I mean, you just mentioned the next novel, if there is one, I'm sure it will be, if there is one, it'll be full of difficulty too, I think. I think that's just partly how she operates as a novelist. Rob, tell me what you thought of Lucy's mother who um, sat with, her daughter for so long. What a complicated, what a complicated character, right? I mean, this in part it's complicated. Someone mentioned this earlier because Lucy fantasizes the ideal mother, the good mother, and then once in a while the real mother will sort of float back in. And this, this kind of spectral presence, both of them are uh, that she can't quite get rid of. This is my uh, favorite moment, one of my favorite moments in the novel, which actually harkens back to the first Lucy Barton novel, where. Um, she begins to think about this, this moment, sort of late in the book, uh, where the memory is this. I was young, my brother was older. He may have been seven at the time. When I walked into the house one day, my brother was lying on the living room floor and he was whimpering. And I saw my mother took in sewing and alterations to make money. I saw that my brother had a series of straight pins stuck into his forearm. I could not believe it. My mother was on the floor leaning over him. I screamed, and what I always remember is that my mother looked up at me and said with an odd smile, do you want some too? And I ran out of the house. One of the reasons I believe this memory to be true is, first of all, it was so strange. Uh, and it is so strange, and I've thought about that a lot, and it's not a memory she can do anything productive with. Which and is why. she feels such regret because she ran away. She sure, ran she away, she did not help her brother. She was so afraid of her mother. So transport that mother sticking pins into the arm of the young boy to the mother who sits in the hospital unbidden with Lucy for an entire week. I, I couldn't make sense of that, Lily. Maybe the, that was the mother's regret. Maybe that's what we were seeing. Who knows? I mean, both <laughs> of Lucy's parents are so complicated and yeah. so, I mean, I cannot enter their psychology. Lucy cannot enter their psychology. And I think that that's, I mean, I could not tell you what's going on with Lucy's mom, but I do think that so much of Lucy makes sense when you think about her as somebody who has spent decades of her life going, who was my mother? What did she feel about me? Why did she do? Why was she kind when she was kind? Why was she awful when she was awful? Is that the same person who was so kind and was so awful? I and mean, Lucy can't know. What do you think about that, uh, Brock? I mean, what about the mothers? transformation yeah and I, I it's if i remember correctly about my name is lucy barton is that it's not a absolute transformation there are flashes of the old mother even in the hospital um so i, I guess the idea is this is what makes her interesting as a character and also as a sort of foil for lucy is because 
you can't quite settle on a version of her that makes sense. Um, whatever you think you can. That, for instance, that moment I just read, you would think, oh, this person is a monster. Then that's all she is, is a monster. And then she appears in other moments where she's quite kind or at least understanding. And yeah. Yeah, and so I think the idea is that this is dumb and broad, but people are complicated. And if they were simple, we wouldn't be haunted by them. I don't know uh, about that mother. She scared me to death. And I found myself thinking, how could she? How could she? And it doesn't seem as though Lucy had any of those moments. I don't want to aggrandize her uh, outlandishly, but it sounds as though despite her own mother, she turned into a pretty good mother. Didn't you read it that way? Anyone? Yes, it's sort of surprising that she becomes the mother that she is because she doesn't have um, she doesn't have a model for the kind of parenting that she's doing. So what she's doing is really quite remarkable. I think, you know, even though I appreciate that Strout acknowledges that Lucy looks away, I think it's also um, sometimes quite frustrating how much, how opaque Lucy is. She can be very opaque, um, to the reader and also to herself. Like there's a part of her that is not that in touch with her own feelings. And that um, that is kind of difficult for me as a reader that I, I, want to, I want to see Lucy a little bit more transparent to herself so that she can deal more fully with some of this past trauma. Uh, here's another question. Do you think Lucy feels guilty about leaving her brother and sister behind in Illinois, and should she? I certainly do think she feels guilty. I think we see that guilt really manifesting partly in her gentleness to her sister, who you know becomes very religious in the way that leads her not to take any COVID precautions, which, you know, if I were if I were Lucy, I'd be shrieking at my sister on the phone. You know, but Lucy takes a step back in a way that does seem very motivated by guilt, I think. You know, she thinks, I left my sister there. Her life is so hard. I'm not going to tell her what to do. Do I think Lucy needs to feel guilty about saving herself from a place that could have really destroyed her? No, absolutely not. But I think it's very human that she does. It's you know another thing where I would be maybe suspicious of her as a character if she felt no guilt. What an extraordinary woman. Lucy is, and why do you think, and this question is for all of you, why do you think her children felt so strongly that she should not go back to William? Why do you think that, Dylan? Well, I think, you know, like more generally, I was thinking that this has to be difficult for children of divorce to see their parents back together, right? Especially after the circumstances under which William and Lucy divorced. But um, I really appreciated that the children had a clear-eyed view of their father in a way that Lucy didn't seem to, um, because it fits with the character, right? What we were just talking about with Lucy not really being in touch with her feelings and having, you know, I mean, she tells Chrissy that she needs to be in therapy, but Lucy also needs to be in therapy. And, you know, so I felt very much like, you know, the girls can see something that Lucy can't. And I think, I think they're right. And I think Lucy knows they're right. And I think she's okay with that. And what about you, Brock? The, um, I mean, it, it makes some sense because the daughters themselves are having marriage problems. And so I think they're in a, probably a place where they're full of skepticism about the motives of people who are in love or not in love. Um, and also it's the kind of whiplash effect uh, that Dylan just talked about, the notion that like, well, we're used to you being apart. Um, we've pined for so many years, especially when they were younger, that you would get back together. We've gotten over the pining. And now you're telling us that 
we shouldn't have stopped pining after all. And so I think um, it, it does. I mean, on one hand, it makes no sense. Like you should be happy for your parents, but on the other hand, it makes complete sense. So yeah, it, it seemed true to me. Seems self-protective too. You know, imagine what would it would feel like for them if their parents, let's say, get married again and get divorced again. You know, who wants that? Yeah. One other question that a number of people asked, do you think this novel had a lot to do with the aging process that people become different, softer, more mellow, more accepting, more understanding as we grow older. Brock, what do you think? That's not my experience, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> How old are you, Brock? <laughs> uh, I feel 105. The, um, I, I, you know, but, so the, yes, I think you're right, of course. There's a kind of perspectival thing going on when you get older. But on the other hand, your whatever your liabilities are, your problems become calcified. They become part of your, part of your character. And that doesn't necessarily mellow you, I don't think. It becomes just simply part of something that people get used to. Um, and this is true of William too, right? Like this constantly, like there's part of his character, like, oh yeah, that's William. That's what William does. Uh, it produces maybe fondness as opposed to resentment, but even that's not absolutely consistent. So what? Well, I do think the book is about aging. I don't know if it's about a kinder, gentler, older person as much as it is about a sort of settling. And I think the fact that they buy this house in Maine, and she says when they buy it, you know, if we buy this house, we will die here. And he says, I know. And she says, okay, let's buy it. You know, like they both, you yeah. know, like they both sort of make a decision and it's almost like they're making an end of life decision and i and i think she she understands that they won't like this is it they they won't divorce this is this is their choice for life at this point and i do think that one can make one can make that decision with very clear eyes at that age especially if it's someone you know everything about so really, i'll give you the last word well, I'll make it a dark one. What <laughs> novel about COVID could not also be a novel about mortality? And how do you write a novel about mortality that isn't about aging? Just doesn't seem possible. Oh, expand on that, <laughs> if you would. I mean, I think that I think the pandemic really made a lot of people, I don't want to say all of us, but everyone I know think about the fact that we were going to die and that, you know, in a lot of cases that our parents were going to die in a way that had been more possible to avoid before there was a terrifying, unpredictable respiratory virus sweeping the globe. You know, I just felt like it was something that we really had to reckon with in a way I did not want to do and would not have done, would not be doing now, I think, um, if it weren't for COVID. And I think that is amplified by numerical age in this novel yeah, but I too it just seems dishonest not to include thoughts about aging mortality the end of life stuff that Dolan is bringing up yeah in a book set during the pandemic well thank you all so much Lily Meyer Rob Clark Dolan Perkins Valdez it was a great discussion and I loved talking with you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Thank you for inviting you. us, Diane. Okay. And a quick note, as you probably know by now, unforeseen circumstances have forced Elizabeth Strout to cancel our scheduled conversation for this afternoon. She sends her sincere regrets. Before you go, please take a minute to fill out a short survey about this event. It's going to pop up on your screen. And if you would consider making a donation to WAMU, it's your financial support that makes events like this possible. You can send them to dianereem.org 
slash give. Our next book club meeting will be Wednesday, November 30. We'll discuss The Paladin, the latest spy novel from Washington Post columnist David Ignatius. And then, God willing, I'll talk with David himself about a career that straddled fact and fiction of international intrigue. Our book club is produced by Allison Brody. Kellen Quigley has been our engineer. Yen Lin Zhang is our events manager. And of course, we couldn't do these events without the support of Lauren Centrella, Rendra Silva, James Coates, Dave Tate, Jerry Washington, and Michelle Morgan, and of course you. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm Diane Rehm. <laughs>